Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about discovery of a new terrestrial or potentially Earth-like planet by a telescope known as TESS. And I actually wanted to start by talking a little bit more about this telescope because not many people know about it, but it is a fascinating piece of technology. So let's start with this and welcome to What The Mac. So this right here is TESS. As you can see, this is actually um, a brand new telescope that was launched only last year. And what's really interesting about it is that it was launched on top of SpaceX. It was created by the MIT. Uh, and for the most part, it was actually funded by Google. So in a sense, it's sort of like, I guess, a private mission, but not really because it is technically NASA's project. And the word TESS stands for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's essentially kind of like Kepler telescope that discovered um, thousands and thousands of planets, but slightly more advanced because it's going to be able to cover much larger area. And in order to do so, it needs a very special orbit, which is what you can see right here on the screen. The purple orbit is the orbit of a test telescope. The green orbit is the orbit of the moon. So its orbit is actually perpendicular to the moon's orbit, and in a sense has a very stable uh, resonance with it. I think it's better if I actually demonstrate this to you using Universe Sandbox so you can see the orbit uh, by yourself. So here is the moon, there is Earth, and the way that TESS orbits uh, this region kind of looks like this. So here we go. This is TESS, this is the moon. It has an inclination of about 37 degrees and it comes relatively close to Earth as a matter of fact, it actually um, comes approximately 100,000 um, kilometers away from Earth, but then it moves um, as far as the Moon. And it has a resonance of about 2 to 1 with the Moon, meaning that for every single orbit of the Moon, it has two orbits of its own. And because of this stability, it uh, doesn't really get influenced by the Moon, although um, in my simulation it does, because apparently I didn't really place it in the right region of space. Uh, as you can see, Moon can actually potentially influence it quite dramatically. And the way that this telescope functions is by uh, moving across the skies right here, um, away from everything, away from the Van Allen's belt, away from most of the interference from Earth. And then when it comes closer to Earth here, it sends most of its data that it collected back, I guess erases its drive, and then does the same again. Every single time it does that, it acquires new data from this imaginary sphere that you see here, and it divides the night sky into these quadrants. And eventually it's going to cover all of these quadrants, forming an image that sort of looks like this. And uh, there will be some gaps here and there, but it will be able to cover uh, pretty much most of the night skies and collect data from the entire night skies that we see. And this is way, way more advanced than what Kepler was able to do because Kepler only got to observe this part of the sky and it was sort of like a cone shaped um, area that we were able to study really well, but everything else is a complete mystery to us right now. And so this is where the um, test telescope is going to be able to cover this whole sphere around our sun. Uh, at a distance of approximately maybe 300 or so light years, it's not going to be as long as the Kepler's uh, cone, but it's going to be much more thorough. And during its two-year mission, we expect it to discover at least 20,000 different planets, including maybe around a thousand or so Earth-like planets. And now it's discovered um, its first Earth-like planet that has officially been confirmed. This planet is located approximately 57 light years away from us, around a star that's a little bit less massive than our sun. It's a K-type star. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to modify our solar system just so you get an idea of what this star looks like. So it's going to be a little bit smaller, just a little bit. And it has a name HD21749. Um, there are two planets that have already been discovered here. And uh, first planet was discovered a few months ago and it's essentially an, a Neptune-like object. It has a mass of about 23 masses of Earth, so 
it is in a sense very similar to Neptune, a little bit more massive. And um, it's much, much closer to the star itself. Because a single orbit here takes approximately 35 days. It's way, 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 way closer to the main star. So there is our new Neptune. Um, and this is a planet known as HD 21479b. We're going to wait a little bit just to see how it changes over time. Now, the new planet that was just confirmed only a few days ago from when I'm making this video is even closer to the star than this object, but it's actually sort of Earth-like. It's approximately 90% the radius of Earth. We don't really know its mass, and it's going to be really hard to find out what its mass is. But what we do know is that um, it orbits really close to its star. It takes about 8 days to orbit once. And so this planet is probably really, really hot. And it's very likely that it's even hotter than Venus. So here the temperatures are going to be over 400, 500 degrees Celsius. And um, it's most likely just a scorched terrestrial object, just like you see right here. Although it's possible that it's some sort of a poofy planet as well, filled with atmosphere and a lot of evaporation. We don't really know just yet because it's just been discovered only a few months ago. But with time, we'll be able to see um, what's going on here a little bit better. But for now, we know that this is the first confirmed Earth-like object that was discovered by the TESS telescope. And as I mentioned, we expect at least a thousand of these objects to be found in the next few years. So during the data collection stage, TESS will observe the night skies for approximately two years. And if its orbit is stable enough, it might even do so longer. And after that, all of this data will be analyzed quite thoroughly by teams of scientists. Now, here's the cool thing about this mission. It's all kind of open source. You can literally go into the database and try to find one of the planets yourselves. Now, I'm not going to say that it's easy. As a matter of fact, um, it's relatively challenging and somewhat complicated. But the data itself is available in the link in the description. And um, it's accessible to everyone who wants to access it. And as a matter of fact, um, a lot of citizen scientists have been discovering planets just like this. They were going to various databases and just trying to find planets by looking through data and developing various somewhat challenging algorithms that would sift through data and try to discover some kind of a pattern, usually a planet. But for now, TESS is going to be focusing on three types of stars. K-type stars, that's the one that we just looked at, M-type stars, which are um, red dwarfs, and of course G-type stars, which are sun-like. And um, we think that most of the Earth-like planets that we are going to be discovering are going to be around M-type, which is red dwarfs, but we also really want to find more of these K-type and G-type Earth-like planets because that's the stars that are much milder, they don't have as much activity, and they will most likely uh, help us discover planets that are similar to Earth. Or at least we hope so. So in the next few years, we'll be able to hopefully discover this. And by the way, um, when you actually count the number of stars that Kepler is going to be studying, it's sort of overwhelming. It's going to be looking at 500,000 stars at least, including 1,000 red dwarfs very, very close to our solar system. So the amount of planets that is going to discover and the amount of actual new incredible things that we're going to know about in the next few years because of TESS is going to be quite exciting to follow. But for now, that's all I wanted to mention in this video because even though we've discovered this incredible planet, it's not really hospitable to human life. It's too hot there. But in the next few years, I'm sure we'll discover at least a couple, but possibly even more planets that are going to be in habitable zones and that are going to be potentially habitable themselves. Well, let's see and find out in the future. For now, though, thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. And if you did, don't forget to subscribe. Share this video with someone who enjoys learning about space and sciences and wants to know more about our universe. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. And... Space out, and as always, bye-bye.